So okay. let me let me start by welcoming all our all our first year master students and to remind you that um, you know the first week you got a very nice talk on sort of the global perspective of integrating many of the components of what we think of as as modern public health and last week we sort of drilled down to focus on the the modeling piece, one small aspect of, of what it is that we do in our profession. Um, this week we're going back to the very global, um, although local in its scope, but global in its in the areas that it covers by having Dahlia Heller, who currently works for the um, as Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Alcohol and <coughs> Drug Abuse Prevention at the City of New York, and who's had a an interesting, uh, should I say, checkered career sure. in checkered. Uh, in providing health services to drug users in New York City to come and talk with us about sort of the very practical aspects of public health. Some of you may find that you go into those practical aspects and we don't teach you that in our school, as you may have figured out. We teach you all sorts of curious, weird things like uh, SAS epidemiology, but um, to get some more on the pub practical public health aspect, I, we asked Dahlia to come and talk about the work she's been doing for the past, though, 13, 15 years, something like that. But you should also know that she is currently in school, uh, getting her PhD at uh, City University of New York. She tells me that her defense date is November 9th. So if you see her in panic mode, it has nothing to do with the audience in front of her. It has to do with the fact that in a month and a half, she's got to defend a thesis. No, I'm you're not panicking. You're cool with that? Yeah. Okay. So, without further ado, Dahlia Heller from New York. Thank you, Robert. Um, okay, so I'm going to lean because I think it will just make it easier for me up here. Um, so, actually, just to context from my own history is that I walked into this role as uh, not my current role, but my previous role um, as a director of a syringe exchange program in New York City straight out of an MPH. And exactly what Robert said, I, I had actually over the course of the nine years that I ran the harm reduction organization, people used to once in a while, like jokingly, friends especially, say like, yes, yeah, so are you using your MPH? They taught you that, right? They taught you like how to do contractor work and build a wall so that you could make offices for case managers. They taught you how to like, you know, call the plumber when the bathroom, whatever, negotiate like the lease with the landlords. So it was actually kind of funny because in a lot of ways, I probably similarly didn't get anything from an MPH that helped me directly in a very tangible way um, develop and run an organization that was doing public health work. And you know, to me, my framework was always public health. Um, but it wasn't I wasn't really using on a day-to-day -day basis my MPH. In my current job working in City Department of Health, clearly I'm actually throwing myself back into all this old epi stuff and wishing I had just done like epi two and three yesterday instead of now whatever, 13 years ago or 14 years ago. So um, it's been interesting. So. I want to talk, I'm going to, Robert asked me to talk about sort of the experience of being a community provider and then um, moving from being a community provider into government and what it looks like doing public health work in those two environments. I don't know how many of you have thought about going and doing community-based work following your MPH or have come from doing community-based work, whether here or um, internationally. Who's laughing? Oh, OK. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, just let me take advantage for one moment. Okay. Please. I'm, I'm Elaine O'Keefe, and I think I know some of you. I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. But I am with CIRA, but also with the Office of Community Health. And for those of you who are MPH students and will be doing a practicum, I'm one of the people that you'll be working with. I was in public health practice for 25 years, and so I, I'm sure I'm going to relate to a lot of what you have to say, Dahlia. But I think it's great that you're talking about public health. <laughs> Okay, good. I'm glad it's, um, okay, good. So I think that's important really is to, uh, if you're thinking about where you want to go, think about how you can maximize what 
what you're going to get out of an MPH to work in a community-based environment because there is not a whole lot. But it, actually, speaking of a practicum, I think that that is one of the few probably direct opportunities to actually get your feet wet or start to think broadly about transferring MPH kind of skills and knowledge into community-based on-the-ground work. So, um, so with that said, um, just to think about what, what I think about when I think about where I'm coming from in terms of doing public health work and what has been a consistent stream in my work over the past 12, 13 years in this area of HIV, substance use, I don't know, poverty, homelessness, um, can kind of build on that, sure, um, has been that I'm coming from a human rights framework. And that was not something that I actually ever thought very, or articulated for myself when I walked into my first job walking out of the MPH which was running the syringe exchange program, but something which was more of a gut response of why I ended up working in a syringe exchange program. Um, and now sort of has developed, I mean, there's a lot of literature that's come out in the last 10 years, I'm sure you're familiar with, on public health and human rights and health and human rights. And there's been institutes that have developed around this idea, and there's a lot more international focus on this issue. But it wasn't so common in the mid-90s, I'd say. And you know, it was sort of, but of course, why do you go into public health? Probably a lot of the reason why you go into public health is because you do believe in health as a human right, and broadly, public health, right? Um, so that's sort of the framework for um, how I approach the work I do, or how I've consistently approached wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, how I think about public health is public health is a human right. So within that framework, um, then I kind of, when I quickly wrote what was I going to talk about or what was the kind of theme of my talk going to be, I used the word power. And, I, and maybe it was like late at night and I was about to go on vacation. I just handed in my dissertation. So I wasn't really, I don't know why I got caught up in this idea of power, but I guess partly because um, people think of government as having a lot of power. And I've, I've ended up in this government official position, sort of quite accidentally. Um, and the idea, it, it's laughable to me in a lot of ways, I guess, the idea that I have power now, because I miss a lot of the power that I feel like I actually did have when I was working in the community. And so I want to talk about what I mean by that when I talk about power. I mean, certainly there are kind of very traditional ways of understanding the power that I maybe have now. But frankly, you know, there was a lot. Uh, the power that comes from community-based work is, and that you develop and can really hone in community-based work to move a human rights framework for public health is pretty significant. So that's sort of going to be the general theme of what I talk about, um, you know, power in a very broad kind of sense. So the way I'm going to talk through this is really chronological. I'll tell you about my experience running an organization and then moving from there um, to work in government and what that transition has been like. Uh, this is probably a different kind of talk, I think, from what you'd normally have in these talks. Am I correct? Right? They're more kind of research focused, these talks usually. Um, so I guess how, how this, maybe this will help me a little bit. How many of you have ever done community-based work? Like, I don't know, any kind of human service work or Peace Corps even, I think, would count and whatever. So a lot of you. And how many of you have thought that you might go back and do more of that after your MPH? Or do that after your MPH if you haven't done it before? A few of you. OK. Um, so and how many of you are interested in doing research um, after your MPH? More and do you, like research is community based research, um, right? I mean, probably you're here. And how many of you have thought you would go into government? Okay, a lot of you too. All right, so that gives me a good sense of they're all sort of the same thing, actually. So it's just the perspective you're in, right? And I, it's quite interesting to think about how you move that perspective around. So um, I started, I had the good fortune, really, of tripping over uh, an individual who was a board member 
of a syringe exchange program that was looking for a director just as I was finishing my MPH. Um, at the time I was working for the Drug Policy Foundation, which no longer exists, um, is now sort of loosely the Drug Policy Alliance, does a lot less funding and more is focused more on advocacy and policy work. But what was interesting is the reason I was working at the Drug Policy Foundation was not because I was particularly interested in drug policy per se, but because when I had gone back to school to do my master's in public health, I had been doing maternal child health work in the community, and that had always been my focus and my interest in where I, I was going. Of course, that meant I was tripping up against HIV, sex work, drug use, lots of these issues, but I was always very focused on maternal child health, women and children, that's where I was, uh, where my interest was. Um, and I needed a job while I was going to school and I got this opportunity, I saw this job posting to work at a foundation and I'd always thought, well I want to go and run a program. That was sort of had developed to be something I was interested in doing. But I'd worked in programs and I felt like, well I understand how to set up a program, I understand how to design service delivery. The thing is mysterious is grants. How do you get grants? What is a grant? How do you write a grant? How do you know what grants are out there? What is a grant? And so I thought, well, you know, let me just see what's out there. So as I'm looking around this foundation job, and it's Drug Policy Foundation, so I interviewed and I got the job. And um, I'm from Toronto, Canada originally, um, but this was all in New York. And so I go to this interview and I find out in the interview that syringe exchange or needle exchange, you know, is a really hot potato in the United States. I was not aware of this. I had actually worked with women in the Bronx who were injectors. Hadn't really crossed my mind about where they were getting syringes, actually, because I just sort of, where I grew up in Toronto, the first needle exchange program opened down the block from my high school when I was 14. My best friend's mom and her boyfriend volunteered there. It was just normal, right? It didn't really blink, yeah, this needle exchange program, whatever. So I go to this interview and I find out that needle exchange is a really hot, weird thing. And not weird, but like very hot and controversial for the United States still. And this was like 95, 96. Um, so anyway, I felt like I had sort of a perspective on it, just having kind of been in the middle of around it, but not really paying attention to it. And uh, of course, it was, you know, I was going to learn about grants, so I was interested in the job. So I got the job, and that's where I worked through my master's. So I developed this understanding of harm reduction. How many of you have heard of harm reduction or know what harm reduction is? Does somebody feel like they could define what harm reduction is? Or if you're eating, it's okay. Your mouth is full. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe to lower, uh, to lower, um, to lower uh, um, access to maybe um, things that can be harmful to you. Maybe like maybe like gluten or whatever. Prevent a so like to prevent access to things that could be harmful to you. Yeah. Or exposure. Yeah, yeah, exposure. Prevent exposure to things that would be harmful to you. Um, yeah, could be. But then you could say, for example, like drug interdiction is harm reduction, right? Maybe because the goal is to prevent drugs from being available to somebody. It's not usually what we think of as harm reduction, though. Um, does anyone else want to take a stab at what? The heck? Go ahead. Yeah, right, so it's sort of taking what is there right now, so what is the situation right now, and how can we address the situation right now to reduce the harms associated, potential harms associated with that situation, right? So, um, but to me there's a philosophical kind of underpinning to that whole approach, which is uh, really based in human rights, again, right? Because it's not about here's this situation, here the way it is right now, 
and oh well clearly you need to change right so you're gonna go over here now and actually I'm gonna fold you up like that and I'm gonna turn you inside out and I'm gonna turn you into the human being I want you to be human beings are kind of complex right I mean we're not really that easy to change or and you know we may even say we want to change but you know there's like another part of our brain that we are not listening to when we say we want to change that's not ready to change yet so to me, harm reduction is really a philosophy that places the power to, for making decisions in the person who's maybe you call like receiving the service or uh, you know, participating in the service really is the way I've always preferred to think about it because it's, it's really that individual has to be at the center of everything, right? So, I mean, a very classic harm reduction is syringe exchange, and that's what we've always kind of, that's what we often talk about when we talk about harm reduction. It's kind of a euphemism for syringe exchange a lot of the time, but more broadly, I like to think about it as like a theoretical approach that's really a human rights approach, particularly to dealing with issues of substance use in human beings. So, Harm reduction kind of made sense to me, learning about harm reduction while I was working at this foundation, the harm reduction, syringe exchange, and I was like, oh yeah, of course, that's like the way I would approach working with people, that's kind of the way I've approached working with people. The woman using drugs, pregnant woman, eight, eight months pregnant using drugs, nine kids in foster care, sex worker wants to keep this baby. So I didn't like harangue her about her drug use, the developing fetus in her body, the nine kids that she'd already lost, why she was doing sex work and could instead, whatever, whatever. Instead I said, well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to keep the baby. Okay, you want to keep the baby, so what do we need, we need to get you into treatment? Okay, so we got to find treatment for a pregnant woman in New York City. You know, so I mean, it was, it was, it was a partnership, right? And I mean, that's sort of, sort of, it wasn't that, you know, she had said, I want to keep using drugs, then it would have been, okay, so how are we going to think about the baby developing inside of you if you want to keep using, you know, I mean, I, I guess, does that make sense? It's sort of just, it's, you know, it's an individual's decision because at the end of the day, it's always going to be their decision. You know, people get drug, people, people get access to drugs in jail. We know that you can't prevent people from using drugs. So I, I could have locked her in a room. If she wanted to get high, she probably would have found out a way to get high, or she would have hurt herself in the process of trying to find a way to get high. It's not about um, controlling people, and I think that's very important. It's a human rights approach to especially working with people who are dealing with issues around drug and alcohol use. So I got this job um, because this I tripped over this board member who was an adjunct professor at Columbia who happened to be on the board of the syringe exchange whose founder had suffered an untimely death. He overdosed and died after founding a syringe exchange program in the Bronx. And he had just really pulled together the skeleton of a program. He had a board, he had a fiscal conduit, he was a photographer, a, a kind of an artist who had made a name for himself and had a lot of friends in the art world, had raised some money through them, so he had gotten like $25,000, um, spent some of that money on buying a minivan in St. Louis and driving it back to the Bronx, so he had a minivan, there was a really old computer, there was still like an MS-DOS, I remember. Um, that I inherited. So, and we were in the donated space in the basement of a church. And it was me and this core of volunteers that had been very committed to him that were still around. And then the board had been sort of in their spare time because they all worked somewhere else, um, organizing the volunteers and coordinating them and continuing to go out and do syringe exchange. Because the one really key thing was that he had managed to get a waiver authorizing this program to do syringe exchange in New York State. So that was the very precious thing that the board did not want to give up. He had found it, he'd done all this work to get this waiver to be authorized to give out syringes to injecting drug users. And that was um, enough to keep them going, searching for a director for a year and a half, and then I walked in. So um, I was there for nine years um, in this position, running this organization, which 
sort of thanks to my very small exposure to foundation grant world, somehow I wrote my first government grant a couple of months into the job and got it and like quadrupled the agency's budget. And then things just went and you know, I kind of rushed to keep up with myself and to what was happening around us. Um, so the organization grew and you know, became this multi-service harm reduction organization. So I guess to think about what was the power that, um, thinking about power in that role or in that space, right? Running a community-based organization, doing community-based work. Um, we were working with homeless, injecting drug users, people living with HIV AIDS, and everybody was using some kind of drug or another at some point in and out. So there was a lot of crack use as well as a lot of injecting drug use. And not everybody was an injector. So because injectors don't just hang out with injectors, just like, right, blondes don't just hang out with blondes or whatever. I mean, people are people. So and we weren't like saying, well, we don't have anything for you because you don't stick needles in your arm. So you just wait at the door and we'll take care of your friends. And that wasn't, you know, that wasn't, that's not really a human rights approach, not really what would feel right in my gut. So it's not how we worked. Um, so that kind of to say that um, walking into this and, you know, immediately you're dealing with issues of homelessness, issues of injecting drug use, issues of therefore access to health care, um, issues of untreated mental illness, and you're seeing what people are not getting and you're trying to advocate for them to get these things that you see clearly that they need and that there are systems of service available and systems of care available to deal with. Um, and those systems aren't accepting these people and they're not working with you. So it's very, it's almost impossible not to start doing advocacy, right? Because you're individually doing advocacy for people you're working with every day and you're seeing actually that there's sort of a systemic barrier to getting people what they need. So, you, you know, I started, I got involved immediately really in um, housing advocacy and advocacy for homeless active drug users because they were really getting shunned by the shelter system as far as I could see also. I mean, they were worse to the worst. It was better for them to live on the street. Um, and then, you know, also of course around syringe exchange and the need to expand syringe exchange. Um, and then active drug users and medical care, especially also, and like access to good health care for people who continue to use drugs. Um, so, you know, that kind of what I was doing was exposing the problem. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to change. And you're doing advocacy on the outside, right? What you're, you're not actually ever going to change something yourself because you need legislation to change or you need a policy to change. What you're trying to do is expose a problem to raise attention to a problem, to bring attention to that problem, these public health issues, and to either humiliate, if that's what it takes, an elected official or government official into recognizing the problem and changing it, addressing it, or actually to, you know, build partnership with them because they say, oh, we didn't know that that was, that's a problem. Wow, that's a problem. Oh, you're right. And we could just change like that and work together, draft legislation and change the problem. I mean, and it can happen both ways, right? And it did happen both ways, I think. I mean, we had some, you have a question? No, no, that's okay. Um, Feel free to interrupt me though, because I'm just gonna keep blabbering, and I'm gonna have to shut up at one. So I'm, I'll try to like move through this. But yeah, go ahead. What are the benefits of the syringe program, and why is it so controversial? Why, why, what are some arguments against uh, syringe, syringe programs and um, why, syringe why, exchange why, programs? Why, why is it so controversial if that's um, such benefits? Right. Um, okay. So what is? Okay. So we recognize the benefits, right? Yeah. We've seen. We know that you know, if people are given access to a sterile syringe and they're an injecting drug user, they're more likely to use a sterile syringe for multiple reasons, including that it's better to have a new needle with a clean point um, and a clean syringe. Um, but also, and therefore, they're not going to be forced into a situation where they have to borrow or you know, their friend has to borrow from them a syringe, right? So we're reducing bloodborne transmission of disease. Why is it so controversial? Um, 
Well, okay, so we have a history in this country of approaching problems of drug use with, remember, just say no, right? I mean, maybe you don't remember just say no, but just say no, right, was Nancy, Nancy Reagan is sort of um, considered to have coined that, or, you know, that was her slogan around in the 80s. Um, and the idea that syringe exchange is giving somebody a tool to use drugs. Um, so it seems that you are therefore then condoning the drug use because you're giving somebody the tool to use the drugs. If you didn't give them the tool to use the drugs, then everything would be okay, right? Well, yeah, if you look at the world, you know, if you operate in a vacuum, but everything wouldn't be okay because then we'd have more HIV, Hep C, you know, and untreated, uh, you know, soft tissue infections, etc., in that population. And, you know, for infectious disease, you know, like especially HIV, more broadly in the community of which those individuals are a part of, right? So when you see, I, I think the idea is are you approaching the issue from a public health perspective or are you approaching it from a I don't like to use the word moral, morality, but it is a, I, I, I don't know how well, I mean, moral, morality doesn't have to be a bad thing. So I don't mean that, in, you know, because I think morals can be good to, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, and I mean, that in the, I mean that in the best way. But I think sometimes, but I do, but in this case, I mean morality, like there's a right and wrong. And it is wrong to use drugs. And if you give somebody needles, you're promoting or supporting or encouraging their continued drug use. And you may, in fact, also be exposing other people to the idea of, wow, I could inject drugs too, because I can get needles there. Never mind that you have to go and get the drugs. You have to want to use the drugs. You have to then know how to inject. You know, there's all these other things. And people don't just choose to inject drugs because it seems like a fabulous idea and something I want to wake up tomorrow and start doing. There's a whole lot else that goes into how and why people initiate drug use, people continue drug use, because experimentation is sort of like a human, I think we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't be in this building, you know, with like four walls and a ceiling and electricity if human beings hadn't been experimenting for a few millennia. But, you know, whether people continue using drugs, there's a whole lot of other reasons why. So, but the backlash or the, you know, why it's so controversial in this country is because this country has a, taken a very strong stance, particularly over the last 30, 40 years, but actually, I mean, frankly, you know, increasingly over the last 100 years, that drug use, all drug use is bad. They tried it with alcohol and it didn't, you know, prohibition really kind of blew things out of the water. So they had to like find, they had to start um, promoting temperance instead of prohibition, right? But with drugs, we've managed to escalate a, a war on drugs. So that's, I don't know if I answered your question in a very long winded way, but is that, so, um, so power in the community. So um, in addition to doing advocacy myself, and as I developed or got more funding and getting staff involved in doing advocacy, and obviously working with other community providers doing advocacy and advocates and researchers, because we need the data that research develops becomes a lot of the time the basis for the argument that we're going to go, you know, in addition to pointing to the five decrepit buildings that the city's placing homeless people with AIDS in or whatever, or, uh, you know, bringing 10 people who are going to testify. It's also very helpful to say, and this famous epidemiologist at Yale University published this paper that shows, that it, right? And, you know, research science, you know, also speaks. Of course, still not to morality. A lot of the time, science and morality sometimes, like, still are not, you know, morality is not hearing science. But um, again, because they're coming from different perspectives of what's important. So. Um, but part of building service delivery then also became coming in contact with people. And 
rather than just being, a, to me, a social service organization, which would have been very humdrum and like in the Bronx, as like the community board would tell you in the South Bronx, the community is saturated. Um, the biggest business in the Bronx is social services and healthcare far and away and um, you know and it's the poorest congressional district in the country so I don't know whatever but uh, you know the politicians are always in close relationships with the nonprofit executive directors and you know the leadership at local community health centers and whatever that is the business um, there's efforts to change and like as, as the Bronx continues to revitalize, it's certainly not the Bronx it was in the 80s uh, by and far, you know, it's, it's changed enormously, especially on the surface. But there's still underneath, there's still a lot of these issues, these public health issues that um, are still need to be addressed. And so if we could have been another social service agency in the Bronx and I really didn't, uh, I don't think that, I didn't feel like that was necessary. We could just give out needles then and close our doors. And people were getting their mental illness untreated. Well, fine, I know there's five mental health clinics in the borough, just go to one of them. Oh, they won't see you, whatever, you know. That's the, you know, I can't really help you. I can't, I don't have mental health services here. Well, the truth is after a while, right? I mean, if you're coming from a human rights perspective, you're not gonna watch and run up against these system walls and not try to resolve them then yourself. So in addition to going and screaming at people and trying to get policies changed and trying to get service systems to treat people like human beings, you're also maybe going to seek some funding to like hire, a, I don't know, a psychiatrist eight hours a week so that, you know, God, at least people could get psych evals here and get medication here. If you can find a psychiatrist who's willing to work with active drug users in a drop in center in the South Bronx, right? And has liability insurance and, you know, whatever to be able to prescribe in, in that setting, et cetera. Um, and so, because they can't bill, right? Because you don't carry your billing ability around with you. There's whole rules around billing, blah, blah, blah. So, um, but that's what I did. So, you know, is that you can't just, we couldn't just not provide services to people that were not getting those services if we were really trying to help people and, you know, help people live, right, and not die. I mean, it's one thing to give somebody a clean needle, but that's not the beginning and the end of it. There's the clean needle and the conversation, and then there's the clean needle and the conversation and the education, and then there's the clean needle and the conversation and the education and the, like, the also the listening in the course of that of like, oh, and you need this, right? And you go back to the cardboard box in the park five blocks away every night, and you go there because the shelter, will let you bring the needles in and or your partner got killed in the shelter three years ago and you don't ever want to go back there or because you know you feel like it's you know more violent than the little place you've carved out for yourself in the park or so you know you need housing so how can we do nah. So we developed services, and as you develop services, will you help people actually improve their lives, right? Because now they're actually able to see a doctor and get that, you know, bad abscess on their leg actually dealt with, and maybe they end up having to get some surgery for it, but, you know, now it's getting better and they're feeling good, it's getting better, and they're, they're getting it dealt with instead of carrying this festering open wound around in their leg all the time. And you know what, now you've gotten them into a supportive housing place, and you can actually, they have somewhere they can go and sleep at night. This doesn't have to be the cardboard box in the park. And so they, their lives have changed. And there's also then, you know, an opportunity for them to have a voice in talking about their own experience if they want, right? So what I also always emphasized was sort of this kind of participatory approach, not just to services. So it's not just about, you know, I'm the center of service, I'm the one who's needing services, but I'm, you know, we're, I'm defining those services. Um, but it's also about my voice, right? And what my voice can, you know, say to the world. So, and I think that there's a lot, I mean, a lot of the time, you walk the line, I guess, with advocacy and um, involving participants of services in advocacy with, and pardon the expression, but like pimping people, quite frankly, right? And I think it's very important as a service provider to be conscious that 
you hold power. You're the one that holds, you know, whether it's just the keys to the nice doctor or the keys to that great like housing that you're going to get me or whatever. So that means when I say, hey, we're trying to fill a bus to go to Albany or to go to DC, whatever, do you feel like I'm making you do that because I might be holding that housing placement over your head? This is like a very important kind of, for me, constantly important um, skill to weigh and to kind of avoid as much as possible, to give people as much power and knowledge themselves to understand, well, what's going on? So what's going on in DC right now? So we would do like at least monthly meetings where it actually talk about policy issues that were affecting people. So people started to get a very clear idea of like, what is the Ryan White Care Act, for example, or, I mean, things are always bubbling up, right? So different things would go on and we'd be talking about them and, or what is um, HOPWA, housing opportunities for people with AIDS, or what's going on with AIDS housing in this country, or what's going on with housing for active drug users, and what are the opportunities out there? So really educating people so that they feel like they have a, an understanding. It's not, it's now I'm in a context, right? Like now it's not, now I see that like my experiences were part of a bigger picture. And that made a huge difference because it's the investment then of the people who are receiving services in the space actually becomes the space. The space is theirs. And you know, designing, uh, you know, architecture, you know, if you're building, you know, we, I had the opportunity to develop space in the course of um, my job and to be able to kind of design the space so that it was open enough so that there was like the ownership, just you felt like if you were receiving services there, you weren't sitting behind bulletproof glass and, you know, three uncomfortable sofa chairs waiting for your name to be called. You sort of had the run of the place, you know, because of the way that it was built. So it was sort of in there's like the food place upstairs and over there is like the cafe area and over here the couches and inter interspersed with offices providing services. Um, and then doing peer education and in, in all of this would, should be a very structured approach to just getting people not only to learn about um, learn about the bigger issues, but also to become leaders themselves in their communities, which again is just tapping into people's natural instincts. So go ahead, you have a question. In terms of the um, um, Master of Public Health curriculum here, what aspects <laughs> did you find helpful, like health policy or social and behavioral um, technology? No, um, none. What questions did you find uh, helpful? It was helpful to be able to read research so I could use it to do policy advocacy stuff. It was helpful to be able to write, you know, because it's always helpful to be able to write, to write a grant. And I, I maybe, I can't honestly remember anymore if there were MPH courses around designing services, like designing programs, but if there are, the, that, that's kind of helpful to think about. But there isn't really a lot, I think, is there in an MPH curriculum that there's community health uh, planning. Uh, I think there's a practicum for community okay. health. Practicums are probably the way to go. Actually. There is. <laughs> okay. I don't. I, go ahead. I think there are quite a few opportunities actually. There are a lot of good courses in the School of Public Health. Trace does an interventions course, there are a couple of practicum courses. Debbie Humphreys does a community practice course. She works as a group of students on a real project. In, usually in New Haven or an area of the community. So I, I think there are lots of opportunities. And, and, and I would say, Dahlia, that in my experience, I actually ultimately used all of that knowledge in my practice in one way or another. So I did think it was a very um, practical degree, which is what an MPH is supposed to be. It is a very practical degree, yeah, I would say that. I, I honestly lack perspective in some ways because it was so long ago that I don't, so, yeah. You? But, um, yeah, and I, I sort of was hurtling for it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you found it difficult to, like, start conversations, would that, like, turn people away? Because I know, like, if, if I go to the dentist, I hate going to the dentist just because they, like, set, start telling me, like, you need to floss, you need to do this, like. Because they're telling you what to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you start to have conversations with these people who are using, does that, like, kind of turn them away a little bit? or? Are they like really open to like talking to you about like 
why, like maybe why they started using or? Have you been to like different dentists? Like I went to <laughs> I, I, the dentist I grew up with. No, I'm no, serious. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, yeah. different dentists have different bedside manner, right? Yeah. I went to a dentist. The dentist I grew up with was, was horrible. I mean, he knew I was like into political things, so he would like stick his hands in my mouth and then start like railing off about stuff that I didn't agree with, right? <laughs> and you know, and making fun of my clothes and whatever, and then hurting me all at the same time. And like, you know, I was like, I left home and I thought I'm never going. There again, like, and I actually found a dentist in New York who I love, which is shocking because who loves going to the dentist? But I love him because he doesn't tell me to floss, like, he doesn't tell you know, okay, so I don't always floss. He doesn't, he doesn't go after me for not always flossing, instead, he points out what's going on in my mouth, right, and explains like how that happens and explains how that could be different. So He's empowering me with information instead of just haranguing me. You know what I mean? I, I mean, does that make sense? No, yeah. It's how you engage people, right? And again, it's how your dentist who's telling you to, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. He's not really putting you at the center. Like, how does he know you live in a place where you can floss every night? Like, or whatever, you know what I mean? How, he, he's not even like finding out about you. He's telling you what to do. Like he's treating you like just like the next guy and now move along, right? Instead of putting you at the center of the picture and like hearing from you and teaching you something and then maybe you want to get into that conversation. Or maybe not. Maybe he'll see you're like whatever. You know, no matter, you fine. You told me about my gum disease. I'm, I'm still getting up and leaving. I don't want to talk about how to floss. So, um, all right. So I guess, I don't, I don't know, I'm like wandering around this conversation a little bit, but just to finish talking about um, community-based services, yeah. I mean, that I just think that there's a lot of power in being able to expose problems and to demonstrate solutions to those problems. And there's a lot more power in community to be able to do that, frankly, than in government because um, you, the lift is a lot less. You're in control, right? You're, you can be creative and innovative in this very particular space. Um, but the reason I left running a community-based organization was because it's also very difficult. You're always also, um, I mean, it's also very difficult. It, I mean, it just, you're, there's a lot of, it, it's a recipe for burnout if you're not, if you don't, know how to manage the work that will never end. Um, and I think, pro I always used to say that I wasn't emotionally mature enough for the job. That was like my uh, whatever. I mean, I started when I was 24 and I, you know, just sort of like, it just kind of ran away from me, like I said. So it, it grew and it was successful and it's still there, fortunately. And, you know, it's serving lots of people and it's always popping. I just talked to somebody yesterday who said they had been there the day before and they were like, whew, now I had a meeting with the participant advisory board and they got an agenda and they want us to work on this advocacy and this advocacy and this advocacy we were talking about. It. And I was like, yeah, and isn't it crazy? There's like a hundred people in the drop-in center all the time. Like, I would have to go to the bathroom and I would not leave my office to go to the bathroom because I knew it would take me 45 minutes to go to the bathroom and back because I would stop and talk to 15 people in the course of it because of the way I designed the space. It was all very open and we were all interrelating all the time. So anyway, in that exhaustion um, and you know, knowing that I was ready for a change and sort of this opportunity showed up um, to go and work at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in New York City. And um, very quickly, because I'm not going to go into that, but I, I would say that in, I've had a particular experience. I don't think working in all any government is the same necessarily. A lot of it depends on the leadership. Um, it, the, you know, I have the good fortune of working in a health department that, although he's no longer there now, Tom Frieden really overhauled the entire health department in New York City after walking in there in 2002, built a huge division of epidemiology, which frankly hardly existed before, um, just on its a standalone on its own to do epi for on all public health issues for the city, really, um, and really kind of developed the work in a very proactive way for the department. And so to work in that environment where um, 
you know, and I suppose more, even more larger, we have a mayor who's endowed a public health school, really believes in public health. And then it's, a, it's also a very, the mayor is very data driven and the health department is very data driven, um, evidence based. And so it's sort of a great pleasure to work in that environment. Um, it could be a very highly politicized, horrible environment. So for example, for syringe exchange, it could be as it was under our previous mayor, who shall go unnamed in New York City, um, but who actually decided methadone was a bad thing and started shutting down methadone programs at one point during his tenure as mayor. And um, I can't even imagine working in a health department when he was the mayor. So I think I wouldn't, you know, advocate working in government in general ever because it entirely depends on the political environment at the time. Um, and then resources are the other issue. But I think you can make do with little. I think you can always make do with little because once you work in government, you have access just by that's where power comes in, right? That's like the what we think of as power in government is like because I can call somebody up and say I'm so and so calling from Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and I still laugh about it. I'm so shocked people call me back like like that. I never people never called me back before. Like I was hoping they would pick up the phone because they weren't going to call me back. I'm hi, my name is Dolly Holler. I'm the executive director of this syringe exchange program in the Bronx. Whatever. They're like, what? A, I don't know who she is. I'm delete that message. But now I'm like, I get a call back like within a day, and it's I mean it's ridiculous really that that's the way the world is and that's the way we treat each other as human beings but it's the truth so that's power clearly I mean this power in name right um, so uh, but yeah and I think theoretically there's power because we can not only expose problems with you know our hands all over lots of data and I, I will say very, just to kind of close this out I mean the um, thing that's been most enjoyable for me walking into the city Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is that in New York City government has not taken a very leadership, much of a leadership role around substance use and issues of substance use since the 70s, since the fiscal crisis in New York City. Um, at that time, the city basically was even running some like methadone services, detox programs themselves, and handed them off to the state, handed off all the responsibility for licensing programs, etc. So we have a public hospital system that operates separate from the department. It's not part of the department, and they certainly have drug treatment programs within their um, within their service system throughout the facilities, but. They don't, um, and they had a needle exchange, short-lived, didn't really work out. They had trouble figuring out how to embrace it in their hospital, but they made an effort, which was good. But, um, but we certainly, as government, have either in a, a particularly in a policy sort of role or developing programs, we don't have a very much of a history around substance use, data, um, studies, anything. So that's been actually really joyful, is that I walked into a job where there wasn't much and I was able to start pushing and creating and developing. And I had a, you know, we've had a commissioner, now we have another commissioner who sees these as very important issues that need to be at the fore. We talk about the actual leading causes of death, this idea that, you know, you have to move upstream from the cardiovascular disease and the cancer to talk about, well, how did people develop those diseases? And alcohol and drug use, you know, figure large in a lot of um, premature death. And so that's sort of the framework now, especially our new commissioners using um, to talk about why we're focused on the initiatives we're focused on as a department. And fortunately, alcohol and drugs are large in that. So I guess that's, um, the, I guess that, that would be my final comment on power in government is, you know, it's not only the political environment, it's also the buy-in of the leadership for the particular issue that you're working on there. So, because for example, you know, we could have not had buy-in on around issues of drug use, so dealing with issues of drug use. It could have been focused on, I don't know, something else, tobacco or something. We did a lot of tobacco work already, though, so. But, um, so yeah, it's made a big difference to have buy-in of leadership of the health department itself to be able to raise the lens on a lot of issues and um, 
build reports, put out reports, put out educational literature, have the department take positions on issues that previously would have just passed it by, etc. So um, I guess the long and the short of my message is that um, there is a lot uh, there's ways to find power and to do health, uh, health as a human rights kind of work out there. And I think from an MPH, you're probably in any in any dire any direction that you go in, you're going to be kind of thinking about, well, how am I going to get this heard? What am I trying to do? And then how am I going to get it heard? Who's my audience? How do they? I want them to hear me. Um, and uh, I guess I would sort of advocate that the, there's a lot to be learned from working on the ground and doing community-based work. Actually, MPHs bring an enormous value to community-based work because of the public health perspective. I would often be asked if I had an MSW, for example, and I don't. I have no understanding. I still don't. I've worked with lots of social workers. I totally needed social workers, you know, to fill some roles in our um, in the organization that I ran. But I, I'm not trained as a social worker, um, and I, I'm trained as a public health practitioner. And to me, that's what community-based work has was has been, and it's sort of the experience I carry into government. And it's one o'clock, so. I did it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>